All right, so this talk is going to be about uh, mobile mesh uh, head nets, challenges, challenges and lessons learned from academia to implementation and deployment. So to start the, the presentation, uh, I'll talk a little bit about what a mobile mesh head net is. So these types of networks are, are typically built up of cell phone towers, uh, Wi-Fi access points, and all the sort of devices that uh, might be using them, so like cell phones and, and laptops and things like that. So there's lots of choice for the devices. The infrastructure is fairly dense, as you can see in the figure, uh, and all the communication goes through the infrastructure, even if the nodes are physically close to each other. So you never have a phone talking directly to another phone. It's always going through an access point, or it's going through a cell phone tower, uh, or some other sort of external device. So a mobile mesh het net is a little bit different from this. We can still sort of use this infrastructure when we need to, um, but sort of instead of always relying on it, we now have the ability to sort of route packets through devices, through cell phones, through laptops that are also playing a part in the network. Um, uh, so the, the nodes that are sort of physically close to each other can sort of avoid costly internet connections. Uh, the coverage of the infrastructure is greatly expanded. Uh, and it can also operate where infrastructure is sparse or non-existent. So why should we use mobile mesh head nets? Um, they're, they're often the most useful in places where there's growing populations, dense cities, limited resources, expensive internet access, and uh, they're, they're best where we sort of have this scenario where, where modern communication tools often require cloud or internet. So if you think of something like Slack or Dropbox, all of your sort of communication right now, when you want to talk to somebody even in the same room as you, goes through your router to the internet, to a, a server sitting somewhere on the cloud, and then back down the opposite direction right to the person sitting beside you. So there's all this sort of overhead that we can sort of avoid. So in the sort of figure that you see here, there's three users all in the same place. They are all going through the same router, but all the data is going all the way up to the internet and back with three separate connections. In a mobile mesh head net, we can sort of make use of this, this proximity to each other and send things directly to each other or hop through a user that's sort of in between two people and, and sort of avoid this, this connectivity to the internet where, where we need to. We can still have this ability to connect to the internet when we need to, but the whole idea with the, the head net meshes is that we connect locally and, and maintain internet connections where we can. So some of the sort of projects that I worked on before this type of work uh, to sort of give you a bit of background myself. Uh, I did a master's in wireless mesh networks focused on resource allocation, uh, things like uh, the farther away that you get from a gateway, the less likely your traffic is to make it there. So I came up with some protocols that solve that problem. I did a PhD in het nets focused on uh, measuring uh, and ranking different network choices and sort of how do we choose the best network to be connected to. Uh, then after that, I started a robotics company and implemented some of the mesh networking stuff that I worked on uh, for Swarm Robots. Uh, and then most recently, I joined uh, Yo or Wave, and uh, we're focused on connecting the next billion uh, without necessarily using the internet. So in my research, I really started early on with very infrastructure-supported mesh networks, uh, some simulation work, uh, and then really went into deploying meshes with, with real devices and increasingly became uh, mobile meshes. Um, so here's a, a couple of videos of uh, a couple of the robots that were using the, the mesh technology and there's, there's some that we did that look more like remote control cars and the same type of technology also powered uh, military types of robots as well. Uh, the current project that we're working on is uh, Yo, and uh, in its current state right now, uh, one of the devices can set up a hotspot or can connect to uh, an existing Wi-Fi access point and then locally share content with other uh, devices all around it. So you can do things like messaging, uh, sharing video, audio, files, uh, and the, the app will be able to detect if a person's close by or if they're on the internet somewhere, and it will use the best sort of connection. Uh, for that. In, uh, so the next sort of thing is sort of the challenges that I faced early on uh, with this type of work. So in academia, the sort of typical way that people uh, work on this type of stuff is with uh, simulation. And the reason for that is because it's cheaper, it's faster, uh, but it's often unrealistic. So uh, schools don't often have access to the equipment for this type of work. 
Uh, and the, so popular simulators like NS2 and NS3, uh, they don't support uh, HetNet simulation very well. So for example, they can't really model the interference between two different technologies. So Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, for example, operate on the same uh, 2.4 gigahertz spectrum, and so they actually interfere with each other, but the simulation tools can't actually model that at all right now. Um, when it comes to building and deploying uh, these types of things in research labs, the, the commercial technology is usually really locked down and protected by the manufacturers. Uh, it's also often not designed for HET nets, so uh, you usually have to sort of shoehorn things into, into working, and consumer technology that like, is more affordable uh, is even worse. So things like Android phones and iOS phones, uh, if you want to do HET nets and, and mesh nets on them, you usually have to root the device or come up with complicated tricks to sort of force the mesh to work. Um, so the easiest and fastest way to, to sort of get up and running with a mesh is using Linux and open source stuff, uh, things like Raspberry Pis, uh, using radios and chipsets and drivers that support 802.11s, which is the, the mesh standard from IEEE, or an ad hoc mode. Um, with Bluetooth, the devices that simultaneously support master and slave mode, uh, or client and server simultaneously, um, are, are useful. But all this sort of stuff isn't really user friendly, so it usually requires somebody that has pretty specific knowledge to even get the, the sort of easy meshes up and running. Um, another sort of challenging area is measuring and identifying bottlenecks in these, in these networks. So a lot of the tools for this type of stuff doesn't exist yet. So visualizing the connectivity with sort of maps of connections and identifying concentrations of users, uh, critical uh, nodes and, and devices in the network. Um, and, and identifying these sort of nodes with, with regards to different metrics. So there might be one node that is really key for, for high throughput in the network, and there might be a different node that's, that's key for maintaining sort of low delay in the network. So this opens things up for load balancing, route optimizations, uh, gateway load distributions, and, and these types of things. So over the course of all this sort of work that I've done in meshes, there's a few things I've learned. Uh, the sort of biggest one is that there's no one wireless technology that fits everything. So uh, on this slide, you can sort of see a table of a bunch of different common uh, access technologies for, that exist in a phone. Uh, so there's cellular, there's Wi-Fi, there's Bluetooth. All of them have sort of different ranges. Bluetooth ranges up to about 10 meters, Wi-Fi 100 meters, and cellular can range in the thousands of meters. Um, and all of them have sort of different capacities. So the sort of closer, low power ones have the lowest sort of throughput speeds, and it ranges up uh, higher with the sort of Wi-Fi and the, the cellular connections. And also the delay requirements are different as well. So depending on what you're doing, if you're doing like a streaming video or something like that, you may not want to use something like Bluetooth. You may want to use Wi-Fi or cellular. But if you have something like an email message or something that can take a longer amount of time, you can sort of strategically pick which networks to use. Uh, another sort of big problem is that the general population has a really poor understanding of, of when they're actually connected to the internet, uh, at least in sort of the, the, the Western world. Uh, they don't really always understand the difference between Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and internet connection, when they're paying, when they're not. So this slide sort of has a bunch of uh, newspaper headlines about people that have spent th thousands of dollars on, on phone bills roaming just because they didn't realize when they're paying and when they're not. So this is sort of the, one of the challenges with, with meshes is just uh, educating the public. And the sort of good thing with the developing world is that people there generally have a sort of better understanding of this. Uh, because they're sort of forced to, because it's so much more expensive uh, there. Um, so that's why it sort of is a ripe area to, to sort of start building these networks. Um, when it comes to, to IoT and robotics, uh, the, the sort of underlying technology can't really adequately provide what we need to be able to sort of build meshes between devices and groups of uh, devices. So. On this slide, you sort of see two different uh, separate groups of robots and there's not really a way for them to effectively communicate with each other. So with, with robotics and IoT, um, a lot of the cell phone companies right now will offer plans that are $30 a month or something, or 30 megabytes per month uh, per robot or per IoT device. And I, they're sort of envisioning this future where we're sending very small messages very uh, infrequently, but um, with robotics and connected cars and things like that, we're going to need things like video at 4K, and with 4K video, you're going to go through your 30 megabytes in five seconds. So 
it's impossible for them to sort of communicate over the internet. They have to communicate locally, but the IoT devices themselves don't have the software on them to be able to determine when they should use a local connection, when they should use an internet connection. And so that's sort of the same type of challenge even with the, the mobile phones that we're trying to solve as well. So what should the future look like? Um, ideally, we should have seam seamless switching between technologies. So uh, think about how your phone automatically switches between cell phone towers as you're driving in your car. You don't actually notice. You don't have to tell it to connect to the next cell phone tower. It just does it in the background. Uh, imagine if our phones could be switching, connecting, disconnecting from Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, 4G, any other sort of technology that it has on it without our intervention. But the sort of way that works now is you have to go into all these pairing setups to connect your speakers for your Bluetooth headsets. When you go onto Wi-Fi access points, you have to go through captive portals and do a login process. Um, and when you're roaming, you have to sort of enable and disable your cellular uh, data. Um, so it always requires this user intervention. So the whole idea is that all of this stuff will intelligently select when and where and how to connect uh, to other devices. Um, and so going along with that, the sort of best underlying network technology should always be chosen for you all the time. So some applications require certain underlying technologies and the properties of them. So for example, with uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, they're probably the most useful for things that require uh, uh, lower speed and, and acceptable delay and stuff like that. So things like uh, text messages and, and, uh, and emails and stuff are good for those types of things. As you get into applications like Spotify and Netflix and things that require streaming, uh, you're sort of at the higher end of Wi-Fi networks and, and moving into cellular networks. And then once you're going up even, even uh, higher into the sort of application requirements, things like uh, real-time control of, of robots and, and uh, safety critical connected cars and things like that, this is where you're going to want to use all the stuff you have available to you at once. So you're going to use your cell phone networks, you're going to use the sort of best cell phone networks you have available, you're going to use your Wi-Fi as well and your Bluetooth so that uh, when you're having these safety critical applications, you're sure that the, the data is going to get where you need to go. Um, conversely, on the operator side, so this is something that uh, everybody's really focused on the user and getting the user the best service. But from the operator side, the people who are running the, the networks that we're all using, they want to also, they have an interest in matching the best possible users to the best possible technology and, and application that they're, they're sort of using as well. So, uh, for example, a lot of cell phone companies now are also deploying Wi Fi networks uh, to sort of offload from their cell phone towers. And they have a sort of uh, problem as well where they have to figure out which users do they keep on the cell phone towers, which ones they push off onto the Wi-Fi, and that's sort of a complicated problem as well. So there almost becomes this sort of uh, matching process between uh, the users on one side trying to pick which technology they want to connect to, and there's the operators trying to maintain the sort of optimal set of users connected to a certain set of technologies. And they're not sort of competing with each other. There's sort of a mutual interest in them both finding this good match. So it's not a typical uh, zero-sum game type of, uh, of problem. Um, in the future, the sort of underlying tech that's sort of powering all this, uh, how the packets actually get from one side to the other, there's a sort of a bunch of different modes that, uh, that this can use. So um, in, in this case, we're sort of seeing a phone that has a bunch of different options to get from get packets from the phone to its ultimate destination. And uh, there's a bunch of different strategies you can take. So on the first one on the very left, uh, you can take the, the single packet and split it up into smaller packets and send parts of it on all of the different options. And you sort of select the size of those splits based on the capacities of the different networks that you can send it on. So you might send a really big chunk on a 4G network because the uh, is the fastest and you might send a smaller chunk on Wi-Fi and then you might send a uh, tiny little bit of it on Bluetooth and then it's also recombined on the other side as it all arrives there. And then you get a confirmation back after all the pieces have been reassembled correctly. Another strategy that you can use is just send the same packet across everything that you have and then as soon as one of the, the packets successfully arrives on the other side you get a confirmation back that it's been sent okay. The third possibility is is probably the combination of both of those two. So you, ha you send across all of the possible options, but you sort of get a, a, 
uh, a response back at every step of the way so that if something gets lost on one of the steps you don't have to resend right from the source so there's always a sort of confirmation on every hop um, this sort of combines things that people use in delay tolerant networks uh, with mesh networks and uh, that's sort of one of the the most interesting approaches I think so what's slowing down the future uh, we don't really have seamless switching between technologies yet so a lot of academic solutions right now propose modifications on the operator side of the network and, and the operators are sort of hesitant to do this because they never know which one's going to sort of win out and become standardized so they don't want to spend money adopting hardware and, and stuff like that to sort of support it. On the consumer device side of things they really restrict the control of connectivity so particularly iOS you don't have the ability to sort of turn on and off uh, Wi-Fi and, and control with a a program which Wi-Fi you're connected to and things like that so it makes it difficult uh, on that side of it um, so that's sort of slowing down the sort of adoption of this stuff um, <coughs> and, and when it comes to sort of s selecting this best underlying technology we don't actually have the ability to measure and collect enough information about uh, the network and the, the choices to be able to even make a good decision right now. So things like signal strength, uh, the local throughput uh, within the network, the throughput all the way to the internet, the local delay, delay to the internet, all these sort of things are like require extra software to be built just to measure do I select the Wi-Fi network or do I select the Bluetooth network. Um, so this is all sort of stuff that's slowing it down. Um, so even though a lot of this stuff requires uh, modification on the operator side, uh, some of it can be done just in software. It doesn't require hardware, um, and it's sort of a risk they're going to have to take where uh, they're going to have to adopt some software if they want to be able to uh, select the best users. Now, it's not required for the functionality on the user side that they adopt this technology. This is more about if they want to be able to select the best set of users uh, for their networks. Um, on the sort of consumer devices themselves, the sort of limitations on the technology is stopping us from sort of building meshes. So we can do these sort of uh, clusters around hotspots, but uh, to sort of connect the clusters together, uh, we can't really use Wi-Fi because the Wi-Fi device is already participating in a hotspot. Um, so things like Bluetooth can be used to sort of link up this middle part, but uh, it's kind of slow. So uh, some work needs to be done there about actually building up the mesh uh, topology. The biggest tech technological challenges, uh, extreme mobility, so as devices are moving uh, fast, the topology changes really quickly, uh, discovering nodes, competing routes. Uh, device density can be a problem and a curse, so if it's too sparse, there's not enough uh, connected nodes. If it's too dense, it becomes con uh, congested. Uh, incentivization is another big challenge, so why should I forward your packet for you? Why should I share my internet? Uh, why should I sacrifice my battery life? Um, Virtualizing the networks, building overlay networks, participating in multiple networks at once is all sort of an unsolved problem right now. So what's working now? Um, there's some very limited topologies that people are sort of building around meshes. You can have uh, sort of backhaul links that are maybe one or two hops with Wi-Fi and then sort of a spoke and hub uh, topology with Bluetooth or sort of an inverse of that as well. Um, so it's built on technologies like uh, Wi-Fi access point mode, multi-peer, Wi-Fi direct, Wi-Fi peer-to-peer. Um, but it's really limited to small meshes right now. Nobody's really come up with a way that you can sort of expand this out into larger meshes. Where are we going in the future? Cities will almost be connected with a, s a second layer of internet. Um, it's all sort of going to be autonomously built uh, and self-organizing. Governments won't be able to control these networks because they're partially centralized. Uh, the networks will be more resilient, have higher capacity, they'll be more efficient than anything we have today, harder to jam, uh, less fixed infrastructure to destroy, um, and delay tolerance built into it means that messages will be delivered eventually even if parts of the network go down. So uh, think of sort of space-based networks combined with cell phones. Um, in this figure we sort of see a bunch of cars, they all have sort of multiple paths connecting them together so they may have connections with Bluetooth, with Wi-Fi, with 4G, and the key is that we have lots of options available and, and we make use of all of them. Um, so in summary, uh, mobile mesh headnets are basically the next step after cellular and Wi-Fi becomes more common. Coverage and connectivity between millions of people uh, without 
necessarily requiring internet will be possible and it'll be the most resilient efficient network we've ever built and it can all be built leveraging the existing stuff that we have uh, no one technology exists and uh, it works well in all scenarios but all together provide excellent capabilities uh, thanks for watching if you have any questions feel free to reach out at the, the email there on the screen and i'd be happy to take any of your questions